بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد حبيب رب العالمين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى Lord of the heavens and the earth and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon our master سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم upon his blessed family his loyal companions and all of those who followed after with excellence up until the day of standing. Ameen, ameen, ameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ennoblement, sincerity, a continuity of His blessings, and a beautiful end. Ya Rabbil Alameen wa Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Summa Amma Ba'd. With the aforementioned Isnad right the way back to Al Imam At Tirmidhi radiallahu anhu, who said in hadith number. Eight. Uh, we had got halfway through hadith number eight, so we were on page ten. Uh, Imam at Tirmidhi radiallahu an in this particular narration, he narrates from uh, he narrates from Sufyan ibn Waqi' who narrates from Jumay ibn Umair ibn Abdul Rahman al Ajli uh, who dictates from his book and says, "Haddathani rajul min bani Tamim, a man from." the tribe of Banu Tamim, who was from the children of Abu Hala, who was the husband of Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha, whose agnomen was Abu Abdullah, relates from one of the children of Abu Hala, from Al-Hasan ibn Ali, the grandchild of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, سَأَلْتُ خَالِي هِنْدَ بْنِ أَبِي هَالَةَ وَكَانَ وَصَّافًا He said, I asked my maternal uncle Hind, the son of Abu Hala, and he was uh, he was an expert in describing. I asked him regarding the description of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa ana ashtahi an yasifa li minha shay'an ata'allaqu bihi. And I really wanted for him to describe something about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that I could cling onto and hold onto tight. So then, uh, the description begins, and we reached. On page 10 in the translation, uh, somewhere near about uh, the middle of the page where we have footnote number 57, uh, he says, Besides the thin line of hair that ran from his blessed upper chest to his navel, neither his breast nor his stomach had hair. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we, we mentioned in the previous lesson, that it's from manhood for men to have hair on their bodies. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to have, bot, to have hair on, 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 his, on his body sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His blessed arms, shoulders and upper chest, however, had hair. So, Besides the thin line of hair that ran from his blessed upper chest to his navel, neither his breast nor his stomach had hair. Whereas his blessed arms, his shoulders and upper chest, however, had hair. He had long forearms and wide palms and full-fleshed, sturdy hands and feet. We spoke about this in the previous lesson, that his blessed hands were fully fleshed, yet they were still very strong and sturdy. Is that clear? Very strong and steady. And we mentioned that Sayyiduna Anas said, radiallahu an, that the palm of the Messenger of Allah was softer than silk. It was softer than silk. And the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his blessed hand and palm, they had both attributes of softness and strength at the same time. For when his blessed hand uh, was uh, touched, uh, uh, touched, for, uh, shook the hands of his companions, they would feel the softness of his blessed hand. And when the Prophet Sallallahu hand was in battle and he faced his enemy, then his enemy would fear, feel the strength and, 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 uh, and the power in the majestic hand of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we mentioned that scholars wrote works just on the miracles of the hand of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for example, Imam al-Busiri radiallahu an in one of his poems, he 
he mentions a list of miracles that occurred at the hand of the Prophet ﷺ. From them was when he passed by the tent of Umm Ma'bad radiallahu anha, that elderly lady in the desert on the, on the journey of migration from Mecca to Medina. And he asked her if she had anything, i.e. To, to, to give her guests. And she said, uh, Abu, uh, um, Abu Ma'bad has taken out the, the sheep. And this, this one stayed back because it was so weak and frail, it couldn't even walk. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if you give me permission, I would like to milk this sheep. And she said, you can try. He ﷺ placed his blessed hands on its udders and milk began to gush and flow from, his noble, uh, from, from the udders of that sheep such that the Prophet ﷺ drank. Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu and drank and they left behind so much milk for the household. So Imam Busiri said, when his blessed hand touched the udders of that sheep, milk began to flow from them whilst it was the weakest and the most frail and there was no hope of milk from that particular sheep. And he mentions that when the Prophet Sallallahu blessed hand would touch the chest of any person with disbelief, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala would place Iman and belief in the hearts of those whose chest he would touch with his noble hand sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentions that if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam placed his noble hand on the head of a child that uh, the the ha the hair that came underneath his blessed hand those hair would never go white even if even if that child reached old age and we have two examples of that one of a companion who reached 94 years of age and the narrator said i did not see a single white hair on top of his head and another reached the age of 120 and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him when he was a young man allahumma jammilhu oh allah beautify him he reached the age of 120 and the tabi'een, they said, and he had only a few white hairs in his head and in his beard. All the rest was black. And from the miracles of his hand, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was that when water was not enough for an army of his companions, he placed his blessed hand in a vessel and water began to flow and gush from his noble finger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Imam al-Tahtawi, the great Hanafi jurist, radiallahu anhu, he said, and the greatest water in the dunya and the akhirah is the water that, that came from the blessed fingers of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's better than Zamzam and it's better than Kawthar because of its close proximity to the body of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And like that, uh, uh, from his miracles we will see in the coming chapter that if he bless, placed his blessed hand on the head of an ill person that ill person would be cured through the blessings of the hand of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam if there was a small amount of food and the messenger of Allah placed his hand within that food it would increase and become abundant such that so many would be able to eat from that which was so little at the beginning but through the touch of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Allah made it grow and increased it and like that so many other miracles of the blessed hand of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam so what do we find that his blessed hand had both qualities of gentleness and strength at the same time and that is rarely found in anybody if somebody has a gentle hand, it's very rare that they have a strong hand at the same time. And if somebody has a very tough hand, it's very rare that they have a soft hand at the same time. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had both qualities in that his blessed hand was very sturdy and strong and at the same time it was extremely soft such that Anas ibn Malik said it was softer than, than silk sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam he said his blessed fingers and toes were long and well proportionate or he said he, his blessed fingers and toes were not crooked and bulging so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's blessed fingers and toes were long and well proportioned well proportioned the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's fingers and toes they were not crooked they were straight and they were in proportion to his blessed hand 
And the Shaykh mentioned in the previous session that the joints of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were large. What does that then mean? That also the limbs on those joints were also strong and large. Were also strong and large, all in proportion to his noble body, Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam. And the scholars have said the the length, the longness of his blessed fingers is an indication of his generosity. Is an indication of his generosity and of his hand opening up and giving. Opening up and giving. And the, the longness of his blessed toes are an indication of the Prophet uh, overcoming and being able to overcome long distances in short times. And we will see the hadith later on when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum said that the Messenger of Allah, when he walked, it was as if it was as if the earth was being folded up for him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Sahaba said, we would try to catch him up, but we wouldn't even after putting such great efforts, yet he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was walking at a normal pace. Yet he was walking at a normal pace. So the only thing that they could describe his walk with, it was as if the earth was being folded up for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon many of the awliya Allah of this ummah also. And what was that? That they were able to accomplish long distances in very short periods of time. In, in very short periods of time. And the, the scholars of Aqeedah said, كُلُّ مَا جَازَ لِنَبِيٍّ مُعْجِزَةً يَجُوزُ لِوَلِيٍّ كَرَامَةً any miracle that was possible for a prophet as a mu'jiza would, would, would also be possible for the awliya of that prophet's ummah as a karama. Except if it was a speciality from amongst miracles. Then that speciality would not be granted to anybody. For example, the Quran was a special miracle given to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the Mi'raj was a special miracle given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But other miracles were, which were not specifically specialities of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the scholars have said, they could also possibly reoccur in the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam amongst the awliya of the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the scholars gave another reasoning for that and said, in reality, any miracle and karama that occurs at the hand of any of the awliya Allah of this ummah, in reality that is a miracle for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa For if it wasn't for him sallallahu alayhi wa they wouldn't have been granted this miracle. So every miracle that occurs at the hand of any of the awliya Allah is in reality a miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No. He said, and he had a slight arch in the soles of his blessed feet. Which area is this? Uh, so if, if, if somebody's foot is like that, there's always an arch here at the bottom of our feet. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his arch was very slight. His arch was very slight. And, for, and it's for this reason, we find in some narrations that he was described not to have an arch. At all. In some narrations, Qadi Iyad al Yahsubi, as Sabti radiallahu anh mentions, a narration in which it says that there wasn't an arch in the sole of his blessed foot. The scholars reconciled between the two narrations by saying that the, the arch was very slight, such that some didn't, didn't see it and did, didn't realize it. Some didn't see it and some didn't realize it. Very similar to uh, the uh, very similar to his blessed eyebrows. His blessed eyebrows. In most narrations we have it that his blessed eyebrows were not joint. Yet we have a narration in which it mentions that his blessed eyebrows were joint in between. Were joint in between. The scholars reconcile between the two narrations by saying 
that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his blessed eyebrows were thin and long and they were arched like bows such that the one who saw from a distance would say that they are connected whereas in reality they were not. Is that clear? So when we have these conflicting narrations, it's a conflicting perspective at which the companion would see. It's a conflicting perspective at which the companion would see. So some said that his blessed souls, the blessed souls of his feet were slightly arched. Now because the arch was so slight, others didn't realize it at all. Is that clear? His blessed feet were smooth such that water could run right off them if poured. Now this is speaking about the top of his blessed foot, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when, if water was poured over them, they would flow, the water would flow immediately. There would be a flow. Uh, the water would not stop on his blessed feet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he walked, he would lift his blessed feet with vigor and he would lean forward slightly and would tread lightly. What do we see here? Again, the way we have two opposite attributes in his blessed hands, like that we find the two attributes that are opposites in his blessed feet to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that he walked with vigor. When he raised his blessed foot, he raised it with vigor. He leaned forward, yet he would tread lightly. Now, somebody who's got a strong foot, Somebody who, who's got a heavy foot and they raise their foot with vigor and strength. We would imagine that that person, when, when he or she puts their foot down, they would, they, they, they would stamp the foot. But how did the Sahabi describe the Prophet ﷺ? He would place his foot lightly. Why would he place his foot lightly? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا And the servants of the merciful, when they walk upon the earth, they walk هَوْنَا They walk with gentleness. They walk with softness. They walk with ease. They walk lightly. And Allah said, وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا Allah said, don't walk upon the earth outrageously. Allah said, don't walk upon the earth outrageously, for you will not be able to pierce the earth, nor will you be able to reach the heights of mountains. Relax, calm down. Thundering on the earth, stamping your feet on the earth is not going to help you, it's not going to get you anywhere. This is why, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا The servants of the merciful, when they walk upon the earth, they walk lightly, they walk soft, gently. The Prophet ﷺ, when he would raise his blessed foot, he would raise it with vigor and strength to indicate what? To indicate that he's out on a mission, to indicate that he's got something to do and somewhere to go. But when he would place it on Allah's earth, he would place it softly. Uh, the great scholar of Damascus, Sheikh Muhammad al-Hashimi radiallahu an, he was one day out uh, uh, with his students in, in a beautiful garden or a park. And amongst his students was a simpleton. And he said, Sheikh, show us a miracle. And the Sheikh said, hang on, I'll show you the miracle. And they carried on walking and they got to the end of the park. And the Sheikh said to the student, did you see the miracle? He said, no, I didn't see it. What did I miss? He was perhaps expecting the Sheikh to fly or to, I, I don't know, uh, pull out some money from his sleeve, some gold. The Sheikh said to him, you didn't see the miracle? He said, no, I missed it. What was it? He said, didn't you see that we walked from that end of the park to this and Allah's earth did not swallow us due to our sins? He said, walking upon the earth is a miracle Allah has given us. Otherwise, we're not worthy of treading upon Allah's earth. Because the earth that we tread upon will either give, give witness for us or against us. And the earth will speak up on the day of standing. This is why we have to treat the earth with gentleness and kindness. Because the earth is a living being. And the earth is in servitude to Allah. The earth will return to Allah 
and praise a people and give good witnessing for a people and for others the earth will speak against them the earth will give witnessing against them so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his blessed foot had strength in it yet when he placed it he placed it lightly now we have a people who assume that their feet have strength in them it's an assumed strength whereas the strength of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is certain the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah azza wa jal gave my body the strength of 40 men from the men of jannah and in one narration he said allah gave my body the strength of 400 men from the men of jannah the men of Jannah, not biscuit men like me and you. Somebody touches us and we break a bone. Men like the men of Jannah. And how were the men of Jannah? With how, what type of strength? We know Sayyidina Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his milk, his brother in milk. When he would go out into the deserts and he would hunt down what? Not a gazelle, he would hunt down a lion. He would hunt down a lion with his bare hands and then he, he, would, he would kill it, strip its skin, dry it in the sun, place it on his shoulder and walk in the streets of Makkah. Why would he do that? To tell people, if I can do this to a lion, I can do it to you. Right? Those were men. And amongst those men, the Prophet said, I have the strength of 40 men of the men of Jannah. So imagine the strength that was bestowed upon the body of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam He had a natural long stride Naturally his stride was long The distance between his steps The distance between the foot that he puts ahead and the foot behind Would be long And this was an indication of what? Again that he's out on a mission He's got to do something, he's got to get somewhere uh, And he needs to, 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 to use up uh, all the time that he's got and he needs to fill up all the time that he has so his stride was naturally long because the one who is going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to go slowly so what Musa alayhi salam teaches us what did Musa alayhi salam say to Allah وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ Rabbi. لترضى. And I hasten towards you, O my Lord, so that you are pleased. So the Prophet ﷺ was doing the same. He would hasten, he would hurry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of his moves, in all of his affairs, so, that, so to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he was of a higher degree than Musa alayhi salam, such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would seek out his pleasure sallallahu alayhi wasallam nevertheless the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam never gave up on seeking out allah's pleasure by hastening and hurrying in in his in his move towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when walk, uh, and when walking it was as if he was descending a height and we spoke about this in the previous session even upon flat earth when he would walk sallallahu alaihi wasallam people would be thrown aback as if they were looking at somebody descending from a height this was because of the awe and the majesty allah had placed around him sallallahu alaihi wasallam when when he would turn to look at someone or something he would turn with his whole body which means he wouldn't do this when he wanted to turn, he would turn with his entire body, face the person who he would be speaking to, and he would give that person his full concentration. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was never, he, his concentration towards anybody was never split. It was all, it was full, it was absolute. Right? And this is something that we need to readjust our brains to and bring ourselves back to. For often, we've either got a mobile phone in our hands or we're giving salam to somebody on the other side. This shouldn't be. Our attention shouldn't be split. It should be full and wholesome towards the one that we are addressing and speaking to. 
The Prophet Wasallam, if he spoke to a child, he would give that child his full concentration. If he spoke to an adult, he would give that adult his full concentration. If he spoke to a woman, he would give that woman his full concentration. If he spoke to a slave, he would give that slave his full concentration. If he spoke to his friends, he would give them his full concentration. If he addressed his enemies, he would give them his full concentration. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is something that man kind in general in our time and believing people in particular we need to retrain ourselves in 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 social skills of how to address people and how to give people our attention and this is very important and when we don't and when we can't give our attention to somebody what should we do we should not engage in that conversation or in that situation or in that meeting where we know I won't be able to give my full. So for example, Imam al-Musili radiyallahu an in al-ikhtiyar, in the chapter of uh, Kitabu Adab al-Qadi, in the chapter of the etiquettes of the judge, the Qadi, he writes that the Qadi should not, give, should not sit for judgments and rulings between two parties in the courtroom if, if he's feeling hungry. If he's tired, if he needs to use the bathroom, if he has another matter that is concerning his mind, he should not sit for judgment until he is totally relaxed and he can give his full concentration to those in his courtroom. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran in Surah An-Nur, he says, if somebody comes to your house and knocks the door, and you are not prepared for them and you feel it's not convenient that you receive them then what should you say? you should say I'm sorry I can't receive you at this time I'm sorry I can't receive you at this time that is better than to receive that guest and not give them your full attention and what does Allah say to the guest? Allah said وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمُ ارْجِعُوا فَارْجِعُوا and if it's said to you, we can't receive you, please leave, farji'u, then you should leave. Then you should leave. What does Allah say next? Allah said, and that, i.e. the leaving, going away, is better for you. That's better for you. One of the great righteous people of Damascus, Shaykh Ahmad al-Harun, rahmatullahi alayhi, he was, he was, he was an unlettered, righteous man of Allah who would sit in Masjid Zayd ibn Sabit and teach the greatest of scholars of Damascus. Yet he did not sit in any madrasa or school and study. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed him with knowledge and Allah bestowed him with, with, with miracle, perpetual miracles one after the other. Perpetual miracles one after the other such that all of the people of Damascus unanimously said that his karamat are mutawatira. They are, they are narrated in multiple chains. Nobody would ever sit with him for a short while except that he or she would experience multiple miracles occur at his hand. He was at home one day and the door knocked. So he went to the door and he said, who is it? And the person outside said, it's Muhammad Makki al Kittani. And who was Muhammad Makki al Kittani? He was the head of all of the scholars of the land of Sham. He was the head of Rabita to Ulama al Sham. There was, a, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a union of scholars. He was the head of them, number one. He was a Sayyid from the Kittani family. And the Sayyids of the Kittani family have the strongest nasab back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a scholar of Hadith, the son of a scholar of Hadith, the son of a scholar of Hadith, all the way back to so many generations. When Shaykh Ahmad Al-Harun heard that Sayyid Makki Al-Kittani is at my door, do you know what he said to him from inside? He said, Sayyidi, I'm extremely sorry I'm not prepared to receive you. I'm extremely sorry. I'm not prepared to receive you. 
we wouldn't do that, would we? Because we don't know the adab of how to receive scholars. We jump to open the door because we don't know the adab. Whereas Sheikh Ahmad Al Harun was in a situation where he felt it's not befitting for me to receive the scholar and the sayyid at this time. So what did he do? He was very clear. He said, Sayyidi, I'm not ready to receive you at this time. Sayyid Makki said, Jazakallahu khaira, and he left. You know what Sayyid Makki said about that instant, that, that incident? He said that was the happiest day and the happiest incident that ever occurred in my life that Allah allowed me to fulfill the command of the Quran when he said Farji'u, I returned and that Allah told me is better for me. Sayyid Makki would always speak about this because he felt Allah gave him the opportunity of following this command of the Quran. Is that clear? So when the Prophet وسلم, would speak to somebody, he would address them with his full. Whether that was during his blessed life or after his noble departure from this world. After his departure. So what does that mean? That means when we send peace and blessings upon the Prophet وسلم, we should give due concentration and focus because when we give him salam, he gives us his full concentration. So Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu an, what did he say? Somebody who prays the four rak'at, and in the first sitting, you're supposed to finish at, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu, and then stand up. Imam Abu Hanifa said, the one who forgetfully says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin, it is wajib upon that person to make the two sajdas of forgetfulness. He saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his dream and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam questioned him and said, Oh Abu Hanifa, why is it that you made wajib upon the one who sends peace and blessings upon me to make the two sajdas of forgetfulness? Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anh said, Messenger of Allah, how dare anybody send peace and blessings upon you in a state of forgetfulness? How dare anybody send peace and blessings upon you in a state of forgetfulness? So, when we, when we connect with the Messenger of Allah, we should connect such knowing that when we send peace and blessings upon Him, we have His direct, full focus and concentration. This is why the great Shaykh Yusuf al-Nabhani radiallahu anhu, he said, in the end of times, what will suffice for people is to send peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for anybody who does so has the full concentration of the blessed soul of the Messenger of Allah towards him or her sallallahu So we have to, uh, we have to learn this social etiquette and mannerism from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa that when we speak to somebody we give them our full attention when we uh, address somebody we give them our full and our mind should not be split this way or that way and if we are in a situation where we believe that our minds will be split our concentration will be split leave the situation to another time when you will have your full concentration when you will have your full focus towards that matter is that clear he would turn with his whole body he would, uh, he would lower his gaze. He would look at the ground more than he would look into the sky, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His blessed gaze was always lowered towards the earth. What, what, what's this? This is a sign of humility and humbleness before the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a sign of humility and humbleness before the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu was asked as to why he, about Imam al-Shafi'i, why he always keeps his blessed sight lowered towards the earth. He said, as a reminder, as a reminder of where I came from and where I will return to. What does Allah say in the Quran? The verse that we recite at the burial of people, minha khalaqnakum, wa fiha nu'idukum, wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. Allah said, Minha khalaqnakum. From it we created you. Wa fiha nu'idukum. 
and to it we will return you. وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى And from it we will resurrect you once again. Once again. Is that clear? So man should always keep his sight lowered, his gaze lowered towards the earth rather than towards the heavens. And that is a sign of humility and humbleness. But the Prophet ﷺ, when he would raise and lift his blessed sight towards the heavens, most times it would be when he would be intensifying his dua. When he would be intensifying his dua, he would raise his hands and look towards the sky, look towards the heavens. And sometimes the most intensified uh, description of the Prophet ﷺ's dua was, when he raised his index finger towards the heavens and he looked at the sky and he said, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum bi rahmatika astaghis. O all living, O all, all the establisher of all things, bi rahmatika astaghis. By your mercy, I, I, seek, uh, I seek help and I seek assistance. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would keep his blessed uh, gaze lowered towards the earth rather than, and, and this is another adab and a social etiquette that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us. For perhaps if our sight is roaming this way and that way, we might end up seeing scenes that are unlawful, scenes that are not pleasurable, or scenes that are useless to us. Scenes that are useless to us. The scholars have said, if we keep our sight and gaze lowered outside of the prayer and less of the scenery of the world comes into our eyes, when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will feel a great, uh, we will feel in more greatness the descent of Allah's mercy towards us. But when we fill our eyes, with too much of the scenery of the world, then it confuses our hearts. Why does it confuse our hearts? Because that which is seen by the eyes is imprinted upon the hearts. That which is seen by the eyes is imprinted upon the heart. So the scholars have said, we should keep our sight lowered and our gaze lowered so that scenery that is, is, is damaging to our hearts is not imprinted onto, a, 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 onto our hearts through our eyes. Is that clear? Most of his looking was from the corner of his blessed eye. What does this mean? That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would keep his blessed gaze lowered at all times. And if he wanted to look towards something, he would look from the corner of his blessed eye. He would just get a glimpse of it. He wouldn't fixate his blessed eye on the matters of the dunya. A glimpse of it is enough and move on. So most of his sight was lowered to the earth. And if there was something that he wanted to see, he would see from the corner of his eye and that's enough. Whereas if we want to fixate our eye on something, we open our eye fully, we look at it uh, head on. But if we want to see, if we, whereas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he wanted to see something, then it was enough for him to see it from the corner of his eye and that's enough. Even though he didn't even need to use his blessed eyes to see Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For as the Sahaba said, he would be able to see behind him as he would see ahead of him sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would be able to see behind him as he would see ahead of him the sahaba radiyallahu anhum they said after we would conclude our prayers behind the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would say who was it that was praying in this manner and that manner the prophet would ask them and then he would say to them even though i am standing ahead of you I can see from behind me just as I see ahead of me. And the Prophet sallallahu sight was so, uh, so perfect 
that if he raised his blessed sight to the heavens, his blessed sight would pierce through all of, uh, of the skies and the heavens and go to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if he was to lower his blessed gaze to the earth, it would pierce through the seven earths and go to the depth and the core of this cosmos. That was the perfection of his blessed eye, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And why should it not be when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it and said, مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى his blessed sight did not waver and nor did it go beyond. It was fixated upon, upon the sight of his Lord Jalla Jalaluhu on the night of Mi'raj. Allah said, Ma zagh al basaru wa ma tagha. It did not waver nor did it go beyond. And the one who was able to sight his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, then who can speak about the perfection of his sight sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What comparison can there be in the remainder of creation to his blessed sight, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Indeed, there is no comparison. He would, uh, he would have his companions walk in front of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if he was with his companions, he would make them all walk in front of him rather than behind him. Why? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his companions, Leave my back for the angels. Leave my back for the angels. Have you ever heard of a leader who walks behind his people? Have you ever heard of a leader who walks behind his people? And yet, he is the most venerated, he is the most honored, he is the most loved, he is the most respected. And he is the one for whom all of his people would give up everything just to see him one glimpse, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What, what height of leadership was in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What courage of leadership was in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he had all of his companions walk ahead of him. And he would walk behind them like a father who was looking onto his children and taking care of them. So he said, Leave my back for the angels. And he walked behind them so he could see every one of them. So he could uh, observe every one of them. So he could see those of them who were in need. Those of them who he, uh, the scholars have said, he would walk behind them, sallallahu alayhi wa to observe them. So that he could see their qualities could see their attributes and know every one of his companions and this was from the miracles of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that he knew every one of his companions he knew every one of his students and if any one of them was missing كان يتفقد أصحابه he would ask about them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walking behind them is a sign of his humbleness sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walking behind them is a sign that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was making, making the Sahaba's experience with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bearable for them. For if, for if he manifest for them in all of his majesty, in all of his greatness, in all of that which Allah bestowed upon him, then let alone the companions, nothing in creation would have, would have lasted. Everything would have perished. Everything would have perished because of the greatness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why Imam Al-Busiri radiallahu an, what did he say? He said, if the Prophet's miracles were raised to the standard of his station, if the Prophet's miracles were raised to the standard of his station, then the mere mentioning of his blessed name would have resurrected the dead from their graves. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, لم تعي, uh, لم بما تعي العقول به. He said, Allah didn't test, Allah didn't test us by that which our intellects and our minds could not comprehend. Allah did not put us into fitna. He did not push, put us into trials and tribulations regarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look, when we hear about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are thrown aback. We feel 
we feel how great was he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We feel so humble within ourselves before the humbleness of this great majesty. That's us. Can we even imagine what was flowing through the bloodstream of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum? When they saw the majesty of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with such humility and such humbleness, what could they say? What could they say? So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had his companions walking ahead of him. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to the house of Sayyidina Jabir ibn Abdullah on the day of Khandaq, when he said, I've cooked some food, that day the Prophet walked in front of them. That day, the Prophet walked in front of them. Why do you think the Prophet walked in front of them on that day? There's a Shama'il book up for grabs. Why did the Prophet ﷺ walk in front of his companions on the day that he went to the house of Sayyidina Jabir to eat? So? It wasn't the Prophet Sallallahu house, it was, it was Jabir ibn Abdullah's house. It was somebody else's house. Why did the Prophet Sallallahu walk ahead of them when he went to the house of Jabir ibn Abdullah? Sorry? To make dua on the food. But he had said that to Sayyidina Jabir. He said to Sayyidina Jabir, don't take uh, the food of the pot until I come. So that wasn't concerning his Sahaba, that was concerning Sayyidina Jabir in particular. Ta'zeem. Protect. Uh, that wasn't a front of attack. They were going to security at that time. Yes. So his companions would not be embarrassed. Why would they be embarrassed? You're, you're close. You've got a red hat on, you're very red. You're in the red zone. Sisters? Go ahead. Okay, think about the story. Think about the story. What happened? What did Sayyidina Jabir come and say to the Prophet ﷺ? Think about the story and it will be easy to work out. Think about the story. It'll be easier to work out. Go ahead. I'm not sure, but is this the story of the Sahaba? No. So it's not surprised if you opened the door. So he wasn't surprised if he opened up the door? Okay, you guys are close. Who knows the actual story? If you know the story, it'll, it'll be quick. What did Sayyidina Jabir come and say to the Prophet ﷺ? What did he say to the Prophet ﷺ? Good. What did Sayyidina Jabir say to the Prophet ﷺ? So Sayyidina Jabir came to the Prophet ﷺ. And he whispered, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I've got a little bit of food. If yourself and a few companions can come. When Sayyidina Jabir said that to the Prophet, the Prophet said, Ya Ahl Khandaq, all to Jabir's house. On that day, he walked ahead of them because he was the one who invited them to the house of Jabir. Radiallahu an. So the invite on that day was for the Prophet ﷺ. He whispered, bring a few people with you. But the Prophet ﷺ, he was the one whose tongue had miracles, his blessed saliva had miracles, his noble hand had miracles. So that day he led them because the invite was specifically for the Prophet and a few others. And you know the Prophet ﷺ, he was a person of the highest principles of mannerism, and etiquette and, 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 and social interaction. I'll give you, another, uh, give you an example of that. When he said to, when Sayyidina Jabir said, Ya Rasulullah, we've got a little bit of food, bring, bring yourself and a few others, and the Prophet invited everybody, then he said to Jabir, 
He said, go home and don't take off the pot until I come and don't bake the bread until I come. Is that clear? He went home and said to his wife, this is what the Prophet said. And he was worried because they only had a bit of food. She said, don't worry if the Prophet has said it, it'll be fine. Right? So the Prophet made Jabir radiallahu anh know that he was going to bring all of these other people with him. And that's important. And that is, if you are invited to somebody's house, you don't have permission to bring somebody along with you unless you have informed your host. Unless you have informed your host, you're not allowed to take an extra person to a wedding, you're not allowed to take an extra person to a meal, a banquet, a party, unless you seek permission from the host. The only time you are allowed and you are encouraged to bring more people in is at the janaza of Muslims. Because then nobody is going to mind it. Now look, the Prophet wasallam, he was the greatest. One day he was invited by a man in Madinatul Munawwara and a few of his companions were also invited. So the Prophet went with those few companions to this person's house. When they reached the door, the Prophet noticed that there was one extra man who tagged along. There was one extra man who tagged along. Now, what would normal people think? People might think that because he is the Prophet wasallam, then anybody who tags along with him, gate crashes, never mind, they'll be given allowance to go in also. And somebody might, be, might think is that who would deny a person who da tags along with the Prophet This is how people think. But this is not how the Prophet thought. When he reached the door of the man who invited them, what did the Prophet say to the host? The Prophet said, we've come, this one's tagged along. If you want and grant him permission, he will also come in with us. Which means, no gate crushing. Which means, if, you're, if you've just jumped on an entourage of a sheikh and backstage you're blocked, don't start cursing those people, I came with the sheikh, they didn't let me in. Mate, you weren't given an invite to come in backstage. That's the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. <laughs> Do you get it? Faraz knows exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> and would initiate greetings of peace, salam, with whomever he met. Whoever the Prophet ﷺ met, he would initiate salam and say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. What does this indicate? This indicates his good conduct with people and his engaging nature with other human beings. He's engaging nature with the people of Medina and his good conduct with people and his humbleness not to wait for somebody else to give him salam, but he would always be the first to initiate the salam. He would always be the first to initiate the salam sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is what the Prophet وسلم, instructed all of us. He said, and to give salam ala man arafta wa man lam ta'rif. To give salam to those whom you know and those whom you don't know. As long as you recognize this person as a Muslim, you say, Assalamu alaikum. Whether you know them or not, that's besides the point. Because the Prophet وسلم, said, every Muslim has upon another five in one narration, six in another rights, duties that you must fulfill towards each other. And one of them is to respond to a person's salam. To respond to a person's salam. But here the Prophet didn't say to give salam to somebody. What did he say? To respond to a person's salam. But we're speaking about giving salam to somebody. But in that hadith, the Prophet spoke about responding. Why? If somebody doesn't give salam, it's not as rude as the one who is given salam and doesn't respond. Somebody doesn't give salam, that is not as rude as the one who is given salam and doesn't respond. Why? To give salam is a sunnah, to respond to it is an obligation. Is that clear? And this is one of the very few 
This is one of the very few occasions in our religion where a sunnah has more reward than an obligatory act. To give, initiate salam to somebody has more reward than the response. And the response is obligatory because Allah said in the Quran, وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا Allah said, وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ And if you are greeted, بِتَحِيَّةٍ with a greeting, وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ If you are greeted with a greeting, then respond to it, reply to it, with the likes of it, or with that which is even better than it. So if somebody says, Assalamu alaikum, you have got the choice of either saying, Wa alaikum as salam, so you've returned it exact, or you say, Wa alaikum as salam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You add on. Is that clear? So Ibrahim alayhi salam, when the angels came to him, what did they say? Allah said in the Quran, Qalu salama, salaman. They said, salaman. Peace. The angel said, peace. When Ibrahim alayhi salam replied, what did he say? Qala salamun. He said salamun. They said salaman. He said salamun. The scholars have said, the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam was better than their initiation. <laughs> Why? Because their initiation of salam was Nusallimu salaman was a direct object of a verb was a direct object of a hidden verb we give you salam whereas the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam was not with a verb it was with a noun and a noun is more affirmative in its meaning more established in its meaning than that of a verb so the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam was stronger and better than the initiation of the angels who came and gave him salam. So the Prophet ﷺ told us that one of the times of one of the signs of the end of times will be that people will only give salam to those whom they know. And they won't give salam to people who they don't know. So we have to return back to the proper engagement of each other as taught by the Prophet ﷺ to us in this hadith. He would initiate salam to people. And why is salam so important? Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu an, the Jewish rabbi who accepted Islam and Allah praised his Islam in Surah Al-Ahqaf. What did he say? He said, the first thing I heard from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his entrance into Madinatul Munawwara was, he said, Afshu salam, at'imu ta'am, sallu bil layli wa nasu niyam, تَدْخُلُوا جَنَّةَ رَبِّكُمْ بِسَلَامٍ He said, the first thing I heard from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was all regarding social engagement, social interaction with each other. What was the first? The Prophet وسلم, said, أَفْشُ salam, Give salam to each other. And the scholars have said, by giving salam, you are extinguishing enmity, animosity, hatred, jealousy, and all of these diseases and ills of the heart that people have against each other, one of the things that extinguishes it is so simple just by saying, Assalamu alaikum. This ex extinguishes that. Why? Because it's salam, it's peace. And when peace falls upon fire, it extinguishes it. Just the way when Ibrahim alayhi salam was thrown into the fire, what did Allah say to the fire? قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا Allah said, we said to the fire, become bard, cold, وَسَلَامًا and cool and peaceful upon Ibrahim alayhi salam. The scholars have said, the fire of anger, the fire of rancor, the fire of hatred, the fire of jealousy, the fire of enmity. How then can this be extinguished? By saying, Assalamu alaikum, and making it a habit, right? When, uh, when Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said, 
Khadija radiallahu anha is going to come to you with some food or some soup. When she comes, uh, inform her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extending salam to her. And then also mention to her that I, Jibreel, am also extending salam to her. When Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha came, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa informed her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends salam to her and Jibreel alayhi salam extends salam to her. What did she in return say? Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. Oh Allah, you are the salam and from you is the salam. So when we say assalamu alaykum, it's not something simple. It's from the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, assalam. And one of the names of Jannah is As-Salam. One of the doors of Jannah is Salam. And when the people of Jannah are asked to enter, Allah will say, Udkhuluha bi Salam. Enter into it with Salam. So this word which we might take so simple and neglect and abandon and give up and not give it any regard, the Prophet is showing us that he always initiated it towards people to keep love and harmony between them. Keep love and harmony between them. So when we walk into our homes, we should give salam. If there, if there is anybody in the home, we should give salam to those who are in the home. If there is nobody in the home, then the scholars have said, we should give, still give salam. We should still give salam. For perhaps they might have been angels in attendance. For perhaps they might have been angels in attendance. Or perhaps they might have been the souls of the righteous in attendance. And if somebody is uh, so fortunate, it's possible that the Prophet Sallallahu blessed soul was also in attendance. So if we enter into an uninhabited or uh, an empty house, we should always give salam. And this is the etiquette that's also mentioned by the Quran al kareem So giving salam to people, we have to make a habit of it. We have to think about its meanings. We have to think about it's the cure within this medicine of as-salam. There's an enormous cure because we're living a very disastrous, a very, uh, a very disastrous situation when people have uh, broken apart from each other. Families have fragmented and been dismantled and uh, torn apart. One of the things that's going to glue people together and bring them closer, just to say assalamu alaikum. Let's make peace. Assalamu alaikum. Right? And what does Allah say in the Quran? وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا And when the ignorant confront them, address them, what do they say? Who are they? They are the servants of the merciful. What do they say? say salam. What salam? In the face of the fire of ignorance, you can't extinguish it with nothing else except with, with, with peace. Send peace to them and walk off. Because that's what will extinguish it. If you confront the jahil with, if you confront the madman or the ignorant or the uh, uh, arrogant, then our teacher, Shaykh Adib Kallas, radiallahu anhu, he said, if you give attention to the madman, you've given him audience. If you give attention to the madman, you've given him audience. And that's exactly what he wants. Whereas if you say salam and walk off, you've extinguished it. You've extinguished that fire. The next narration, Simak ibn Harb uh, said, I heard Jabir ibn Samara say, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a dali' mouth. Ashkal eyes and manhus heels. I Shu'ba asked Simak, what is meant by dali' mouth? He replied, a grand mouth. A grand mouth. Now the scholars have said, the grandness of the blessed mouth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, could indicate that the outer of it was grand. And the grandness of it is an indication of eloquency is an indication of eloquency and that Allah bestowed upon him such uh, comprehensive words that he would say little but they would have so much meaning. This is why Imam Ibn Hisham radiallahu an in, in his uh, muqaddima of Qatr al-Nada and Ballu al-Sada, what does he say? Was salatu was salamu ala man maddat alayhi al-balagatu 
من من مدت عليه البلاغه رواقها وشدت به الفصاحه نطاقها he said peace and blessings be upon the one above whom eloquency upon whom eloquency raised over its its canopy peace and blessings be upon the one above whom eloquency placed its canopy and the one by whom eloquency tied its bout nitaq is about what does that mean that means that eloquency of the tongue meaningfulness of words comprehensiveness of meaning all of these matters they took influence from the prophet and not the other way around for if for 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 comprehensiveness of words eloquency of sentences uh, the, the the depth of meaning all of these matters would be based upon how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke based upon how he sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke nobody would search for how he would spoke in the language of the arabs because he was the most eloquent of them one day sayyidina abu bakr as-siddiq radiyallahu anhu said messenger of allah you grew up amongst us how is it that you are the most eloquent of us and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and why should i not be the most eloquent of you while i grew up in the tribe of banu sa'd i would say the halima sa'diyah radiyallahu anha and the scholars have said and this was a uh, appraisal for the people of banu sa'd and the tribe of banu sa'd in that they were the 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 most eloquent of arabs and in another narration the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and why should i not be the most eloquent of you whilst allah gave me the quran and from that the scholars have said and the one who wants eloquency in his tongue the one who wants comprehensiveness in his words the one who wants meaningfulness in his sentences should make oft recitation of the quran al kareem should make oft recitation of the quran al kareem and imam al ghazali radiyallahu anhu in the ihya he mentions a story of an old woman who would never ever speak even her day to day conversation except that it would be by verses of the quran anything that she said anything that she was asked any response that she ha- would have to give any question that she would ask would always be using a verse of the quran al kareem otherwise she wouldn't speak so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam having a grand mouth is speaking about uh, the the physical is an indication to the metaphysical the physical is an indication of what's going to come from 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 that place some of the scholars have said his blessed mouth was grand in that his blessed teeth were bright and strong uh, and and large i.e. in proportion to his blessed mouth so some when they spoke about dali al fam they spoke about the inner of his blessed mouth and some spoke about the outer of his blessed mouth uh, both can be put together for for, for the meaning of dali al fam i asked what is meant by ashkal eyes he replied the space between his upper and lower eyelids were long what's that see if we open up our eyes we open up our eyes fully then the upper eyelid and the lower has a large space in between the messenger of allah his blessed eyes were naturally like this without him needing to further extend uh, between his upper and lower eyelids sallallahu alaihi wasallam I asked what is meant by man whose heels he replied of little flesh of little flesh in in the heels i the so we spoke about uh, the, uh, the the arch in the blessed soul was uh, very minimal 
And now the sh uh, we, we hear that the blessed heels of the Prophet وسلم, they were not uh, they were not fleshy, but rather the flesh of them was little. What does this indicate? This indicates that the blessed foot was very strong and firm. This indicates that the blessed foot was very strong and firm. And when it would, uh, when it would touch the ground and it would tread upon the earth, it would tread with firmness due to there being little flesh on the blessed heel, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next narration, Jabir ibn Samura again, radiallahu anhi said, I saw the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on a completely moonlit night. When is it completely moonlit? The middle night, the 14th, that's called the Badr, the full moon. Now we have in cities, there's too much light pollution. So we don't realize how much, how radiant the moon is. But if we go deep into the countryside, where we, there's not many lamps on the streets, and people switch off their lights at night, and there's not many cars around, and we're in a very deep, uh, in, a, in a very dark, black night, and the full moon is it in its full, that's when we will notice and realize how radiant the moon is, how illuminating the moon is in the depth of the night. Uh, Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu anhu, he said, it was a night like that in which I saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So now, you, can you imagine, Madinatul Munawwara, the streets didn't have lamps, the homes didn't have electricity, the night people would blow out their candles and go to sleep, right? After Isha, everybody would be asleep because people would have to get up early in the morning to go out for their work and do their businesses and look after their cattle and get ready for Fajr and etc. So people would sleep after Isha, that's it. Not even after Isha, even after Maghrib, people would start nodding off. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, we would pray Maghrib in the masjid and we would stay in the masjid. And whilst we were sitting in the masjid, we would fall asleep because they would be tired after a long day's work. So, and plus it would start getting dark after Maghrib, very quickly it would start getting dark. So now imagine Madinatul Munawwara in a situation like that. And Jabir ibn Samara is out. There's no light pollution. The, 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 the sky is pitch black. And he sees the full moon. And there he sees the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa And what does he say? He said, I saw the messenger of Allah on a completely moonlit night. And he was wearing two red garments, hullah. And we spoke about this in the last lesson. I began to look at him and then look at the moon. And by Allah, he was in my eyes, more beautiful than the moon sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who, who can appreciate this? The one who lives in the countryside and sees the dark night and sees the radiant stars and the radiance of the full moon would be able to really appreciate what this means. For Sayyidina Jabir ibn Samura to say, and the Prophet was just much more beautiful than the moon. What did he say? He said, and by Allah, he was in my eyes. Why did he say in my eyes? He wanted to make this description of his for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wanted to personalize it. He wanted to express within it, not just a description of the Prophet, but the deep feelings and love of his heart. He wanted to speak about the deep feelings and the love that was within his heart for the Prophet Sallallahu This is why he said, in my eyes. In reality, that would be the case in anybody's eyes who saw the Prophet Sallallahu But why did he say, in my eyes? He wanted to personalize his relationship. And this is why the scholars have said, if we look into the history of Islam, we find, we find people are always speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu In every generation, in every people, in every language, uh, describing him, praising him, speaking about his life, his seerah. Why? Wasn't the first work of seerah enough? Was, weren't those encyclopedias of seerah enough? No. Every scholar wanted to personalize 
their narration of the Prophet Sira and bring it out to the people. And that's the story of love that we spoke about that's hidden away in the hearts of billions of Muslims across the world. They have a love for the Prophet wasallam that they have covered away in the closets of their hearts, but they need to bring out that love. Because the people before us, they express that love. They made that love manifest within creation, upon civilization, in people's social interactions, in people's lives, in people's every movement. They brought out the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we learn from Sayyiduna Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu an here, is that we need to personalize our love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you speak about him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, speak about your experiences. Speak about your engagement, speak about your love, speak about your knowledge concerning him, regarding him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Ishaq, who reported, a man asked Bara ibn Azib radiallahu an, was the face of the messenger of Allah like a sword? No, he replied, rather it was like the moon. So a man asked the companion, Bara ibn Azib, was the Prophet's face like the sword? What was he trying to make a comparison with? With the, the sword has a shine upon it. The, sh the sword has a shine upon it. And the sh number one, and the number two, the sword is long. Al-Bara ibn Azib immediately said no. He was like the moon. In that, his blessed face had a roundness to it, rather than a longness. Is that clear? Now here the scholars have said, this comparison is partial, as we mentioned previously. This is not a total comparison. The reason the, 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 the reason the companion made the comparison was to indicate the approximation of the Prophet's noble face and countenance to have a roundedness to it rather than a longness. This is one. And the other was to indicate that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his, uh, the, the radiance of his blessed face was like that of the moon in that in the, in the depths of the dark night, the moon illuminates the area around, whereas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like that and even more in that he would illuminate during the day and during the night. So the comparison is partial and not full and total. What Sayyiduna Al-Bara Ibn Azib wanted to teach that person was that his blessed face wasn't long, but rather it was rounded. Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, and I think this is the first narration on, yes, this is the first narration on behalf of Sayyiduna Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, who reported the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was fair complexioned, as if fashioned from pure silver. As if fashioned from pure silver. So first he said he was fair complexioned. And then he said as if fashioned from pure silver. Why did he say as if fashioned from pure silver? To indicate that the fairness of the noble complexion of the Prophet wasallam had an illumination to it too, like that of silver. So it wasn't a fairness that was bland, but rather it was an illuminating fairness like that of silver. This is why he combined between these two descriptions. His hair was wavy. We'll speak about the blessed hair later on in the chapter of his blessed hair, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jabir ibn Abdullah, there you go, the companion who's gonna feed all of us, inshallah. He was a companion and his father was a companion. His father was martyred in Uhud. He, he came to the Prophet ﷺ, Sayyidina Jabir came to the Prophet ﷺ, said, Messenger of Allah, if I cover my father's head, his feet are showing. If I cover his feet, his head is showing. When was that? When he shrouded him and placed the coffin over him. When he was martyred in the battle of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ said, cover his head and leave his feet. What does that indicate? That the Sahaba didn't have much clothing. They didn't have much clothing. Cloth was very scarce. Very, very scarce. They didn't have much. And that indicates the simplicity of the lives of the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The simplicity of their lifestyles. 
that they would, would do with that which they could get by with. And that's enough. The Messenger of Allah, so Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu reported the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the Prophets were presented to me. The scholars have said this was either in the night of Mi'raj or in a dream. Number one. Number two, the, the Prophet sallallahu said, they were presented to me as an indication of uh, he, the supremeness of his noble rank amongst the Prophets and Messengers also. Even though they all went before him, in appearance in this world, yet he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the leader of them and he was the first of them and he was the last of them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And lo, Musa alayhi salam was a medium build and it was as if he was one of the men of Shanu'a. Shanu'a was a tribe from Yemen and they had very particular features by which the Sahaba knew them. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described Musa alayhi salam, he said, it, he was like the people of Shanu'a, of middle stature, middle height. Now the scholars have said, from this hadith, what do we learn? From this hadith we learn that it is from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to speak about the description of the Anbiya. Why? Why, do we, why, did he want, why did he speak about the descriptions of the Anbiya and why did he want us to do that? Shaykh Abdullah Sirajuddin radiallahu an mentions in his Shama'il, he says, for the description, for the physical descriptions of the prophets and messengers, and in particular our noble prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when it is sketched in the heart and made clear to the mind, every time his blessed name is mentioned, one would see the prophet in their heart and mind. This is the reason for knowing the descriptions of the Anbiya. And it would bring the message of the Anbiya closer to us when we know how they looked Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to describe the Anbiya who had gone before him is an indication to what? That even the Prophets who we were not directly part of their Ummas, we are not part of their Ummas, their Ummas have gone before us, their time went before us, yet to even know about their descriptions is a sunnah of our Prophet He is teaching us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? So that we can have a deep relationship with all of the Anbiya. So that we are not disconnected from the Anbiya. This is why people of the world, they speak about role models. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave us 124,000 role models in the Prophets and Messengers. Every one of them is a role model for us. Allah said in the Quran to the Prophet Sallallahu some of them we told you the stories and others of them we didn't. But those of them who Allah told us their stories, we should know about their stories. We should know about their characteristics. We should know about their noble traits because those are the people who we look up to. Those are the people who are examples for us. Then I saw Isa, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, and the closest person I have seen who bears a resemblance to him is Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi radiyallahu an. Urwa ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an was from Ta'if. And he was the one at Hudaybiyah who was, uh, who was making the agreement on behalf of, uh, on behalf of the Meccan people. Uh, he was not Muslim at that time. Later on in the ninth year after Hijrah, he accepted Islam. And then when he went back to his people to invite them to Islam, he was saying the Adhan and they killed him. And when the Prophet ﷺ found out that they killed him, the Prophet ﷺ said, he is like the man of Surah Yasin. Who is the man of Surah Yasin? وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ اتَّبِعُوا مَنْ لَا يَسْأَلُكُمْ أَجْرًا وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ The Prophet ﷺ said, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi radiyallahu an is like the person of Surah Yasin regarding whom Allah said, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى And from the furthest city a man came to them and said, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ He said, oh my people, follow the messenger. And that's Exactly what Urwa ibn Mas'ud did. He accepted Islam and he went back to his people to invite them. And what did he say? 
Follow those who don't ask for any uh, compensation, any reward from you whilst they are guided, i.e. the prophets and messengers. So the Prophet وسلم, said, uh, the most resemblant of people that I have seen unto Isa السلام, is Urwa ibn Mas'ud, al-Thaqafi radiyallahu an. وَرَأَيْتُ Ibrahim. What do we notice about the prophets that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned? Musa alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam. Prophets of scripture, prophets who left behind large nations, prophets who we are very deeply connected onto. Then he said, I saw Ibrahim, then I saw Ibrahim alayhi salam, and the closest person I have seen who bears a re resemblance to him is this companion of yours, meaning himself. What did the Prophet say? He said, وَرَأَيْتُ Ibrahim فَإِذَا أَقْرَبُ مَنْ رَأَيْتُ بِهِ شَبَهًا صَاحِبُكُمْ يَعْنِي نَفْسَهُ He said, if you want to know how Ibrahim السلام, looked, then just look at me, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Why? Because he was the child of Ibrahim السلام, وَمَنْ يُشَابِهَ أَبَاهُ فَمَا ظَلَمْ And the one who resembles his father has done nothing wrong. The one who resembles his father has done nothing wrong. And the scholars have said, there are some, uh, generally it is the children by whom, uh, generally it is the parents by whom, generally it's the parents by whom children take honor. My father was so-and-so, my grandfather was so-and-so, I come from a lineage of so-and-so. Generally, the children take honor in their parents. Except in the case of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of his forefathers took honor in the child that they had in Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For they did not have a child who was more honorable, more uh, venerated, more raised in rank and in station than Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then I saw Jibreel Alaihi Salam and the closest person I have seen who bears a resemblance to him is Dihya. Al-Kalbi radiallahu an. Sayyiduna Dihya Al-Kalbi radiallahu an was an extremely handsome companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, such that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would send him out when he wanted to send uh, notes and letter when he wanted to send letters to the kings and the emperors and the rulers of the world. He would send out Sayyiduna Dihya radiallahu an. Why? Because of his beautiful appearance in hope that by his physical they would be attracted to that which he has come with and the scholars have said from this we learn the the the, the extremely wise understanding of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding social interaction with people and that which will impact the hearts of people now nowadays uh, in in the corporate world in the professional world we're taught how to dress if you're going for an interview. People are taught how to dress, how to appear, how to uh, enter, how to sit, how to speak. What are the first words you should say? All of this is taught in the corporate world and in the professional world uh, and in the world of media and in the world of marketing. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had it placed in him by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the companion that he would send out to the rulers and the kings would be the most beautiful of them. Sayyidina Dihya radiallahu an, it's not mentioned that he was from amongst the scholars of the Sahaba. It's not mentioned that he was from amongst the scholars of the Sahaba. Yet he was the one who delivered the Prophet's message. He took the Prophet's letters and handed them to the kings and emperors. Why? Because of a trait, a characteristic that he had within him that the Prophet ﷺ had confidence that because of this, people would be attracted to the religion. And then, Allahu Akbar Kabira, Allahu Akbar Kabira, Allahu Akbar Kabira. The Prophet ﷺ chose Sayyiduna Dihya Al Kalbi as his messenger. Allahu Akbar Kabira, Allahu Akbar Kabira, Allahu Akbar Kabira. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose Sayyiduna Dihya Al-Kalbi as his messenger. So Allah chose for Jibreel Alayhi Salam as his messenger to go to the Prophet in the form of Dihya Al-Kalbi. What does that mean? 
that the beauty that the Prophet was pleased with in his messenger, Allah bestowed that exact same beauty upon his messenger to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when, when, the, when Jibreel alayhi salam would come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would come in the form of Dihya al-Kalbi, because Dihya al-Kalbi was the form that the Prophet was pleased to send out to the, delegate, to, to the emperors and the kings of the world. Look at, look at Allah's love. Look at Allah's love for the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet chooses a particular person for his messenger. Allah sends his messenger in the same form. One day Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha said, Messenger of Allah, what was Dihya doing in our house? And the Prophet said, did you see him? And she said, yes. The Prophet said, that wasn't Dihya. That was Jibreel alayhi salam, who when he comes to me like this, he comes in the form of Dihya al-Kalbi radiallahu anhu. And from that, the scholars have said, it is possible for other than the prophets to see the angels. It is possible for other than the prophets to see the angels. And at that note, I heard from Shaykh Ayman Rushdi Swaid regarding his grandfather, Shaykh Muhammad Amin Swaid radiallahu anhu who is the contemporary of Al-Muhaddis Al-Akbar, Shaykh Badruddin Al-Hassani radiallahu an. Shaykh Ayman Swed, he is one of the greatest scholars of the Qur'an and the Qira'at of the Qur'an in the world. He said, my grandfather, Shaykh Muhammad Amin Swed radiallahu an, was invited to a meal in the house of a friend of his in the area of Maidan. So he went and he sat with the rest of the people and they ate. Just before, a few moments before Salatul Maghrib, he asked his host, who was a very close friend of his, if he had permission to go up to the balcony of his house, which was facing towards the outside. And the host, who was a friend of his, said, of course, Sheikh, you can go up. The Sheikh said to his friend and the host, he said, on the condition that nobody Categorically, nobody comes up, number one. And number two, when it's Maghrib time, call me from the bottom and I will come down. So the Sheikh went up, Maghrib time came, and the host forgot that the Sheikh said, don't come up. So the host walked up to the balcony, and he saw Sheikh Ayman Swed, Sheikh Muhammad Amin Swed. When he saw him, the Sheikh realized that he had come. The Sheikh said to him, didn't I tell you not to come? He said, sorry Sayyidi, I forgot. Anyway, it's Maghrib time, let's go down, went down. The host, what he saw, he said to the Sheikh, he said, Sayyidi, outside of the balcony, what was that? That when I came, went away like a light in the sky. And the host also said, when I went up to see the Sheikh, he was standing on the balcony looking into the sky and there was like a light, like a cloud, in, like a light in a cloud that was very close to him. And the Shaykh was saying, La ilaha illallah rabbi ghfirli, la ilaha illallah rabbi rhamni, la ilaha illallah rabbi ghfirli, la ilaha illallah rabbi rhamni. O oh Lord, forgive me, O oh Lord, have mercy upon me, la ilaha illallah. He was repeating this. So his friend asked him, he said, Sayyidi, what was that? When I came, it disappeared in, uh, in hurry, so quick. The Sheikh said, that was the angel of istighfar who came to me and I was making istighfar. He said, that was the angel of istighfar who came to me and I was making istighfar. This wasn't the only time. Sheikh, Sheikh Ayman Swed said, and when my grandfather, Sheikh Muhammad Amin Swed radiallahu an, he passed away. He said, my aunt Fatima told me that from, uh, from the day that he passed away and in the room that he passed away for 40 days for 40 days there was birds that entered into his room and made tawaf of his bed upon which he laid and passed away on he said, she said for 40 days and she said the day that he passed away he was lying on his bed she said I was sitting on the ground besides him and I saw an enormous white bird come and sit on the edge of his bed behind his back radiallahu anhu. So the scholars have said, from the hadith of Sayyidah Aisha, 
and from the miracles of the awliya Allah of this ummah, it is possible for those other than the anbiya to also see the angels. It is possible. No. The next narration, uh, Saeed al-Jurayri said, I had Abu Tufail say, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and there is no one remaining upon the face of the earth today who has seen him besides me. Allahu Akbar. Sayyiduna Abu Tufail, this companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Tufail was the last, absolutely, the last of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to die. He was the last person who passed away. He passed away in the year 110 or 111 or 109 around this time after migration. He was the last of them. And you know, even his death was from the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Because exactly a hundred years before that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, there is no soul upon the face of the earth that is alive today. There is no soul that is upon the face of the earth that is alive today that will be alive in a hundred years time. What, meaning that after a hundred years, everybody that is alive today would have died, would have passed away. And the last of them was Sayyidina Abu Tufail radiallahu anhu. What did he say? He said, there is no one remaining upon the face of the earth today who has seen him. The scholars have said that Abu Tufail was speaking about himself. He was telling people about himself that there is nobody other than me who is remaining upon the earth who saw the Prophet ﷺ. Why did he say this? He said this so that people would know where they need to come to hear the Prophet's description. He told people this so they knew where to take that knowledge from. When we were studying the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari radiallahu an, our teacher Sheikh Naeem said, that there were certain narrators of hadith and scholars of hadith. They would say to their students, these certain chains of narration, nobody on the face of the earth has them other than me. They were not saying this out of arrogance, but they were saying this as a matter of clarification to the students that nobody else has these chains. You will not be able to get this knowledge this particular knowledge through those chains from anybody else. Why? Because perhaps all of their colleagues who studied with them had died. And we had an example like that in Syria. Sheikh Bakri at Tarabishi, Rahmatullah Ali, he was a colleague of our teachers, and he was one of the uh, one of the eight Qurra, eight reciters of the Quran who had passed the age of 80, very old man. But he alone, he had the shortest chain in Quran transmission upon the face of the earth. Upon the face of the earth, there was nobody who had a shorter chain of Quran transmission than Sheikh, Sheikh Bakri Tarabishi. You know what the Sheikh used to say? He used to say, this is not because of my doings, but rather this is because when I went to study the Quran and its Qiraat in Egypt, I studied with a teacher who was extremely old and I was very young in my teens and all of the rest of his students were much older than me and they have now all died and I'm the only one who survives. Do you get it? This is why the scholars have said, it's important that we take our children to the majalis of the elder mashayikh so that the young can be connected onto the elders and like that they will jump generations of scholars when they narrate later on. When they narrate later on. So Sayyidina Abu Tufail was the last companion to pass away. What did he say? Uh, I said, so the person who he's speaking to was Saeed al-Jurayri. Saeed al-Jurayri said, I said, describe him to me. He said, he was fair complexioned and of a handsome countenance, moderate in his qualities and features. So what did he do? Abu Tufail, who was a very old man, and he was the last of the companions who was alive. 
he gave a very comprehensive description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said to this man, he was fair complexioned and of a handsome countenance, moderate in his qualities and his features. So what was the striking matter that was left with this companion regarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That he was moderate in his qualities and his features. And that's what's important, is that we pick up moderation from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We pick up comfort and ease from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The last narration of this chapter, An Ibn Abbas, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiyallahu anhuma, he said, Kana Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam aflaja saniyatayn iza takallama ru'iya kan nuri yakhruju min bayni sanaya. He said, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a slight space between his two blessed front teeth. His two blessed upper front teeth had a slight space in between. Right? He said, when he would speak, I, when the Prophet Sallallahu would speak, something like a light would be seen emitting from between them. Can you imagine that? Allahu Akbar. The Prophet Sallallahu is speaking to his companions and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas was a little boy. How old was he when the Prophet left this world? He was 13 years old. When the Prophet ﷺ passed on from this world, Abdullah ibn Abbas was only 13 years old, yet he was from amongst the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba. Why? Again, from the miracles of the hand of the Prophet ﷺ, the night that Abdullah ibn Abbas stayed in the Prophet's house at night, he said, the Prophet placed his noble hand on my chest and said, Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa allimhu ta'wil. Oh Allah, uh, grant him a deep understanding of the religion and teach him the explanation and interpretation of the Quran. From the touch of the noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala filled his vessel with knowledge. He said, when the Prophet would speak, remember he was from amongst the young sahaba who would be looking at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would be uh, uh, observing him, watching him, so that they could register in their minds. He said, when he would speak, you know what makes this description even more certain? What makes this description even more certain? That a child is narrating it. That's what makes it even more certain. Because sometimes adults can exaggerate and say that which is not. Of course, we don't say this about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that they would exaggerate. But the description of a child would be perfect. Why? Because children are innocent in their minds. They only describe what they see. They only describe what they see. They only say what they told. Dad said, don't op Dad said Dad's not at home. Right? Somebody knocks the door and the kid comes and says, Dad said Dad's not at home. So the kid only says, do you get it? So, this is another reason why the descriptions of the Prophet are of the highest levels of perfection because they were all narrated from the young Sahaba. And children are those who don't add on and don't decrease. They just say it as it is, blatant. So for Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah to say, when he would speak, it was like a light emanating from between his blessed two teeth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's because he saw that. that. That's because he saw that light coming out from his blessed words, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And you know that light? That light has covered his blessed words till the day of judgment. This is why the scholars of hadith have said, our ears are like the hands of a goldsmith. Our ears are like the hand of a goldsmith. A goldsmith, you take him gold, he'll touch it and say, okay, this is pure, this is mixed. Just through the experience of his hand. The scholars of Hadith have said, our ears are like the hands of a goldsmith. We have experience in knowing the words of the Prophet wasallam due to the light that they are enveloped in so we can recognize that which is not from his words. So we can recognize 
that which is not from his words just by listening is that clear just by listening and also the scholars have said the way the people of the Quran the reciters of the Quran the memorizers of the Quran the teachers of the Quran the Prophet Sallallahu described them in a hadith and said Ahlul Qur'ani hum Ahlullahi wa khasatuh The people of the Qur'an, they are Allah's special people They are Allah's people and Allah's special people The scholars of hadith have said Ahlul hadithi hum Ahlul Nabi wa in Lam yashabu nafsahu anfasahu sahibu The scholars of hadith said Ahlul hadithi The scholars of hadith said Ahlul hadithi أهل الحديث هم أهل النبي وإن لم يصحبوا نفسه أنفاسه صحبوا. The scholars of Hadith said, the people of Hadith they are the special people of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And even though they did not accompany his person, yet they accompanied his breaths. They accompanied his breaths. How did they accompany his breaths? By, his, by listening to his words, by reciting his words, by going out of their way and traveling the earth just to hear one hadith from a person. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, radiyallahu anhi said, I walked, I walked, the, uh, I walked the amount of the earth three times round in seeking hadith of the Prophet I walked the amount of the earth three times round in seeking the hadith of the Prophet And as Imam Muslim in the uh, introduction of his Sahih mentions, companions will travel from Madinah al Munawwara all the way to Egypt just for one hadith. Hear the hadith and come back. They will travel from Madinah al Munawwara all the way to Syria. Hear one hadith and come back. Uh, we, we know of the man who traveled from Andalus from Spain all the way to Baghdad to hear hadith from Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal radiyallahu an. When he reached Baghdad, they said to him, Imam Ahmad is under house arrest. He said, I've traveled the earth to, to reach him. Show me where he is. They said, we're not allowed because there's two policemen outside his door. What did he say? He said to one man, I want you to walk down the street where Imam Ahmad lives. And when you pass by the house of Imam Ahmad, kick a stone in its direction and carry on walking and I will know that's his house. So the man, he did so, he kicked a, a stone in the direction of Imam Ahmed's house and then he carried on walking. This man who came all the way from Spain, knocked the door of Imam Ahmed and Imam Ahmed said to him, what do you want? Don't you see the police outside my door? He said, Imam, please let me in. He took him into the corridor of his house. He said, I want you to teach me hadith. He said, I can't because I'm under house arrest. He said to the Imam, Look, what we'll do is, I'll come to your house every single day pretending to be a beggar. Let me into the corridor of your house and teach me one hadith every single day. Imam Ahmad agreed. So this man would come like a beggar, whilst there's police outside, enter into the corridor of Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad would narrate one hadith to him and he would go. Every day, every day, every day. Until Imam Ahmad was released from house arrest. And then he came back to his grand masjid where thousands of students with their ink pots and their pens and their books were ready to take from the dictation of the memorization of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal 